Hello, and welcome back to the Covey Wellness Center podcast. I am Sarah Covey, the host of the podcast and the clinical director of Covey Wellness Center. And today on the show, we have Rebecca Knowles. She is one of our newest members of the team, and you might have heard a little bit about her in our panel discussion in our first couple of episodes with some of the Yorkville students on our team. Rebecca is just about done her practicum, finishing out her time with us. Eight months um, is the practicum, so it's a really extensive learning and training time. And uh, Rebecca's here today. We're going to be talking about mental health and teens, working with teens, why we love teens. So all about this teens, teens primarily, but also a little bit into preteen and young adult kind of thing. So that particular age group is the focus for our discussion today. Um, and so we're going to just begin and maybe Rebecca, if people want to know a little bit more about your background, they can go back to episode one and two um, of this season. But why don't you tell us just a little bit about what you're doing here at Covey Wellness Center and tell us a bit about your background with teens. Yeah, of course. So I'm so close, as Sarah said, to completing my practicum. I should be done in April, and then I can just continue onward from there. It's been a long haul, but I'm really excited to be done. It's like the final hoops to jump through to get there. Yes. um, Through my journey at Cubby Wellness Center, I have been working with a lot of youth and with a lot of teens, and a lot of my roster and clients are teens and that young adult age. Mm -hmm. Um, like you said, you have been involved with teens in your life too. And I just find that I've always connected well with them. Mm -hmm. My, my first job getting paid was with city of Barrie day camps. And I started there as a camp counselor right when I was able to, I think around 15 years old. And so I was working with young people and I worked through the ranks there. I became a supervisor. And I think I spent about five summers day in and day out working with young people and creating right. those camps for them. So I have spent a lot of hours with you. Yes. Yeah. So the, these are just a natural rapport building group for you. Like this is a group that you know really well before you even became a registered psychotherapist. Yes. And before you were even doing this work, you just had this connection with them. And I know they've always been a passion for me as well, because I have, I taught for 15 years in a high school system, which most people know that bit of my story, um, but just have a real heart for teens and see um, that age group with their particular niches and their particular needs. And um, it's so rejuvenating to work with teens. I think it always keeps you feeling you are young, Rebecca, but it keeps you feeling young when you're even yes. my age to work with young people, their, their vitality and their vision and their, um, excitement for life. And there are also some challenges that are uniquely theirs, um, in a lot of ways. And so, um, you know, it's a really important group to be supporting. And I know we're going to talk a little bit later about sort of the, the post COVID world for young people and what that's, what's happened for them and, and that sort of thing. But let's start with just what's your favorite part of working with teens? Why is this teens, young adults age group, such a, a passionate group for you? So I think it's very unique working with teens because we all know they're not fully developed in the frontal lobe. We're still learning and they're exploring the world for the first time. So everything that's happening is their first and it can be confusing. It can be nerve wracking, anxiety producing. And I just like to see what comes about with them and see their thought process, their likes, their dislikes. They have their own language sometimes, like their slang that they use. Yes. And I just, I really like to see what organically comes from the teens when I'm speaking with them. I I try to open up the platform for them to share what they want and try to have that open space for them. And every client is unique with what they bring to the Mm. space. So really cool seeing that. Yeah. And I think like you're saying the developmental stage and just the rapid changes and experiences and that differentiation and individuation that happens in this stage where they're moving away from they're still dependent on their parents but they're kind of moving away from that dependency and they're finding their way in the world and they're asking Mm -hmm. the big questions about you know their their 
partnerships and their friendships and where they want to go with their lives, like what their first stop is in terms of career. And there's just so much um, excitement in that stage, but so much growth, like it's a really steep learning curve. And so it can be overwhelming, right? There's a lot of, I, I remember when we worked in, in the high school, you know, these kids would come in looking like little kids in grade nine. Yes. And then in four short years, they'd be graduating and going off on their own to wherever they were going, workplace or college or university or whatever, trades sometimes. And it was like, they were like, those years are packed with learning and growth and development. And so when you're walking alongside someone, you know, who's a teen or even in that preteen into that stage, it's not a long amount, like it's not a long season of their lives, but no. there's just rapid changes in their body, in their relationships, in their independence, like so much is happening. So it's really neat because if you work with a client over the course of a few years, like sometimes I would teach someone in grade nine, then teach them again in grade 12, it was just really fascinating to see how far they had come and, you know, how much they've grown into themselves and those kinds of things. So it's really rewarding in that sense. And Sarah, you were saying how having the teenagers, they're trying to differentiate themselves from their parents, but yet we have spoken together about the importance of having those adult role models and having those healthy adult relationships in their lives other than their parents. And yes, I really think that's important. And I can see the importance within my clients, like being there for them. And we may not have a specific thing to talk about that week. And I'm like, okay, what's, what's coming up for you. And just having that connection and being able to build that rapport, it mm. may just be them talking about their week and something specific that came up, but having that healthy adult in their lives, I think that's really important that we've been saying before. Yeah, for sure. And the re like I used to work in student success and some of the research around student success as a department, which is looking at at risk youth and supporting them in the high school system. And one a lot of the research was around um, what constitutes success for a student, like what do they need to be successful? And a huge part of the research around that was several supportive adults who are like the more supportive adults they have coaches therapists teachers um you know youth group leaders like the more supportive adults they have that are not their parents they do need their parents but those extra people in those roles the more potential they have to sail through their teen years because they really do need those those adults who are maybe even just a little bit ahead of them um, in, in the world and in their age and things, but they can provide that perspective and that safe uh, yes. mentorship, coaching, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's so important. And so of course, therapy can be a part of that care team for, you know, your kids, your teens, your young adults, because you are wanting them to have the support, but sometimes as a parent, they're not, you can't be that person for them. And I have to, as a parent of four preteen teenagers, I can't be their counselor. I have to be their mom, even though I am a counselor, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's really important for them to have those other safe people um, set up in their lives that they can talk to, that they can work through things. And I like your point, Rebecca, about it doesn't have to be from um, a problem solving standpoint that they come into therapy. It can simply be from a proactive, your mental health matters this is a space for you to, to talk about whatever it is you need to talk about, to work on whatever it is, whether there is a severe issue of some kind or not, you know, yeah. it can simply just be, this is something you're doing um, to support the ongoing health of your mental health. And so um, I think that proactive piece too, because the other thing with teens is, you know, um, they do like to talk. For the most part and you know some of them are a little more introverted but for the most part teens want their stories to be heard i mean we all do but they can have a lot of words sometimes and really want that i mean i remember that about kids wanting to stay after class or hang out at lunch to have those they're dying to have these conversations about these big questions with people that they trust and so to create space for that is so important and then if as they move into their life you've normalized therapy Right. It's just the yeah. same as going to a doctor to consult about physical, you know, considerations or to do 
um, checkups, proactive checkups. Like these are all things that we can normalize so that if and when they do run into a challenging situation, they've already got a rapport with the therapist um, and they already feel like therapy is a perfectly normal thing. Yes. You know, and yes. so I, I really believe strongly in being proactive about our health in general. And this is just a way to be proactive about mental health. So we don't always have to work with teens who, you know, sometimes it gets to quite a desperate spot before people come in. But this is true for all our clients. We are not a crisis intervention center. You don't have a limited number of sessions with us. You can simply come because you're concerned and you want to make space for your mental health to be a priority. And you're going to gift yourself this hour. Um, you know, we have lots of clients. In fact, lots of my clients at the stage that I'm at are kind of on what we call like a maintenance mode, which is essentially they come once every four to six weeks just to check in, just to make sure they're staying on target with their self-care plans, to check in, to give themselves permission to pause and say, where am I at with my mental health? Have I take stock? Have I noticed anything changing? Do I need to regroup, get back to some practices? Do I need to alter that self-care plan because I'm in a different season? But it's just that that constant to, to say, I'm not going to go for this length of time without without checking in, without having that accountability. So yeah, that's awesome. So we have lots of teens doing that as well. Like you say, they don't always know what they're going to talk about, but somehow the session is filled and it's always valuable. So that's yes. amazing. Yes. And I love when they come to the right realizations on their own and yes. you can see their thought process and you guide them on that journey and you're asking those probing questions. And then all of a sudden they're like, yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. I, and they say it themselves. And I go, that's yeah. therapy. That's it. You did it. Like, yeah. I love having those connection points. So I think totally. And don't you think too, it's so fun when the parents are telling you like, my kid is so looking forward to therapy and then the kid. So there's this affirmation that even with their parents are like, yeah, I can't wait to talk to Rebecca or can't wait to meet with my therapist. And yes. also this idea when they come to therapy, it's like, okay, here's my th stuff. Like there's lots of kids who will come like, okay, I was waiting for this. This thing happened in the cafeteria on Tuesday, this and this, yes. like they, they're ready. Like they're saving these things that they know are important to talk through and process through. And they're coming because they're so engaged in the work. And that's, that's, it's just so fun, right? It's just such a delightful thing to be able to do for them. Even though, you know, certainly the teens have struggles and not all those conversations are about easy things. You can see their engagement with the process, which is, that eagerness, that um, uh, commitment to it. Like sometimes we don't even have that with our adult clients, mm -hmm. right? Because, and so they're not availing themselves maybe of as much as they could get from their therapy because they're not participating to the same extent. So I love when I see that with a teen. Yeah. But um, segueing from that, there are, you know, we're talking about all these joyous things and, and certainly teens are wonderful and we love them. But there are some common struggles in this age group that might be slightly different or or similar, but have particularities for this age group. Like obviously this age group is dealing with anxiety and every age group does, but like sometimes that shows up a certain way for, for teens. So talk to us a little bit about some of the common struggles that the teens that you're seeing um, and working with are, are voicing, are struggling. Yeah, of course. So one of the major things are social issues. So most of them are in high school, um, university age, and navigating those relationships, whether it's new friendships, whether it's friendships that they want to try and navigate away from because they're not serving them anymore, new romantic relationships, like what do healthy relationships look like with them? Mm. And also what I think is a lot of the clients and teens these days, they're overthinking and ruminating about those social interactions mm -hmm. so what does so and so think of me now that I said that or do I look okay today what do they think of my outfit or I'm up all night thinking about what I said to Susie last week and it just sticks with them and they want to be accepted and they mm -hmm. want to be heard and loved and just navigating that like how can we change those thoughts and move away from that negative catastrophizing cognitive distortions why mm -hmm. are we overthinking about those interactions is there evidence to support that mm -hmm. right yeah the rumination for sure especially around social issues I would agree you know we all know that feeling of lying in our bed at night and running through the conversation that happened. And could I have said something different there? Or what did he mean by that? 
you know, and, and so I think that's escalated because again, you're trying to figure out who you are kind of in these teen years. And maybe we are still doing that as adults, but it doesn't look the same way in terms of the in groups and the out groups and where do I fit in and who, who understands me and who do I like? And, you know, who likes me, like all these questions. So like social stuff. And then a layer that has got to be part of that is the role of um, social media that especially is new. Um, you know, in this current generation, like my kids and, and certainly younger, a little bit older, but you know, this was not a thing. So this has escalated so many of the social concerns and issues, self-consciousness, insecurities, uh, bullying, like there's lots of things that are coming through social media. Um, and there's, there's good and there's challenges from social media. Like I'm not making a statement on, on, you know, social media as like an evil in its own but there are some really significant challenges like things can be ramped up through social media in ways that you know in previous generations those things would die down when you went home from school now they ramp up or why is so and so talking to me on social media but yet we can't talk to each other in person like why are we able to have those social connections one-on-one together why does it have to be that we're friends online but not in person it's like bridging that gap which totally. is very interesting to see. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so a lot of the anxieties really do revolve in a lot of cases around social dynamics and relationships and figuring out boundaries and communication and uh, self-worth and identity and all of that. Right. So there's lots of top topics around that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think um, we sort of see the general things that other people in other categories see too, like, you know, kids experience grief in different ways, you know, in their lives. And so we'll see um, kids who've been through the grief and loss of say a divorce or the loss of um, a parent or grandparent, they're working through that. Um, Sometimes we'll see, you know, general anxiety and depression and things like that that we're dealing with that are just these mood disorders that are escalating for lots of reasons, sometimes lived experience, sometimes hormones, sometimes um, what's happening in the world. And maybe this is a good time to go to that. Like the you know, COVID has really changed things for a lot of people, (laughs) all of us, really, it's not really ever going to be quite the same. Um, But for teens, there are some really particular things that they are experiencing related to COVID. And some of that is what you've alluded to there. The, we don't know how to interact in person because we only, we've lived so much of our social life online. Mm -hmm. So even my own kids, it's very hard for them to make an actual phone call you know, to phone someone and speak to them on the phone. And like, that was our lifeline when I was a kid, Yes, right? Like I was the one in my room hiding under my pillow, talking to my boyfriend after when I wasn't supposed to be on. And at that time of night, because the, the rates were cheaper, right. To phone long distance or whatever, like it's a totally different world. And so for them, like the navigating the actual in-person world, especially teens who have gone through COVID in some of those highly social years. Yes. It's very yes. difficult. So yes. what are you seeing around that? Like, what are you seeing uh, in terms of the changes as a result of this, the pandemic and everything? If I could put it in a simple term is just, we're a few years behind. Mm. Like it, they had that time where they were in their rooms, they were not having those social interactions. So what you would be experiencing at the age of 16 normally, you're now experiencing at the age of 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of delayed a little bit. And what comes with that along with social issues is the pressure of what am I doing with my life? Mm -hmm. And what's my next step? Like I am in grade 12 and COVID started when I was in grade nine. I spent my high school years trying to figure out if I'm at home doing school, at school doing school, navigating all of that but now am I going to university am I am I staying home for a year like what does that look like and the pressure that they have from their parents or Mm -hmm. the outside world other people that have come before them it's very interesting to see yeah I would agree and I think I think we're catching up right like even academically we see that we're catching up we've got all across the boards in in education delays in terms of the acquisition of skills you know the the reading writing arithmetic, you know, it's, it's behind and we're catching up um, as a result of COVID. And that's true socially too. Like maybe their, their dating relationships are pushed 
off, or maybe the dating relationships they have are not in person, right? Yes. It's all happening online. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, and how do we merge those two worlds? Right. Yeah. And, yes. and it's a very different thing to show up online in a flirtatious or, um, you know, engaging way. And then to stand in front of the person that, that same person, it could be paralyzing because it's not, you haven't acclimatized to it. We were so isolated. So we, yeah, I agree. I think that delay, like everything's just a little bit slower. And then I think generally anxiety is the big thing, anxiety and depression, but, you know, just generally hypersensitive, maybe that much more tentative and fearful, trying to get their grounding. I mean, their whole worlds were turned upside down yes. and there's a lot of loss in that too. Like a lot of the the university aged kids lost a lot of things in high school, you know, performance opportunities, graduations, um, you know, proms, um, like their final years on their school teams, like all that stuff. And they don't ever get that back. No. You know, they can't yeah. just become, a, you know, on their junior volleyball team again, no. that that opportunity is gone fully. Yeah. And like I said, they're experiencing life for the first time. So they're missing their first if they're mm-hmm. not delayed, they're not even happening. So they don't get those experiences, like you said, but yeah, there's and no I, makeup I, for it. For sure. And I think there's a bit of an overcorrection in some cases too, where teens are like, let's do it. Like, let's, let's live. Like they're wanting to live large and not be held back because they've been so confined. So there's so many interesting things, even for kids who might not articulate that COVID was like a particularly hard season, although I don't know many kids who wouldn't say that it totally sucked, Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, but just the repercussions of that in, in coming out of that season and trying to open yourself up to the world and find your way, it's a big, it's a big deal. And, and they've been struggling and certainly the discouragement and the isolation, you know, has led to low mood, low activity for a lot of kids. You know, we see a different uptake in sports, for certain age groups. I know with my kiddos, like they couldn't run a baseball team last summer, for example, because there wasn't enough interest in that age group. And a lot of that, that sedentary lifestyle and leading to like, normally kids are active and out playing ball and doing things, but they all kind of were insulated and on their computers. And so all of the ways that that affects their well being and trying to change that trajectory to come out of it, you know, it, you can be in really low mood, low activation, that hypo arousal, um, that can lead to those like hopeless, like why bother, you know, because at at every turn through COVID there was another shutdown or there's another lockdown or like, as soon as you thought it was going to change, like there was a double back. And so you can see how people will become really discouraged by that and tentative and not wanting to trust that they can, they can re-engage and not just be slapped back again, you know, or something taken away. There's a lot of that hypersensitivity um, and hypervigilance because of the trauma they've gone through. And that social anxiety piece too. Totally. I haven't spent time with them in this many years. So why would I go out for the baseball team now? Like, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. It feels like that's an insurmountable thing instead of just a normal progression. Right. So it's, yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. And so being able to talk through all of that, to process that, to see a different way to understand where that's coming from. um, Because I think sometimes we can think, oh, COVID's over. And so we're just going to flip a switch and everybody's going to be okay again. And that's not true for anyone, but it's especially not true for these teens and young adults, because the impact of those couple of years on those formative years is still unraveling and they're still finding their way. And I I think it's important for that not to be their experience, not to be minimized. Right. So that's something that we can do for them in therapy is give them a space to actually kind of catch up on that reflection. Okay. Um, Anything else that we've missed in terms of the types of things that you're talking with youth about um, that, you know, was on your radar to bring forward we've covered lots of different things we've covered a lot the last thing I would probably say is excuse me the self-compassion piece Mm. so being able to be kind to yourself and if that goes in hand with self-esteem but having that positive self-talk and switching that voice inside your head like you are your own worst critic your own worst enemy a lot of the time and you see that in teens with the comparison with social media so just being Mm. able to be kind to yourself and and be your own ally, not enemy. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's so important. And if if they can figure that out as a teenager and get skills yes. with that, man, 
they will be sailing through adulthood because so many of us still are wrestling with that because you know, we didn't have that early understanding, right? So early intervention is always good with mental health strategies and stuff too, because they'll serve you your whole life. Yeah. Um, one other thing I thought about is just general school stress and like, um, mm. yep. you know, organization and uh, like management of time and part-time jobs and extracurriculars. I think there can be a lot of like overwhelm in all the things of life. And again, that can be pronounced because in COVID, like they were doing nothing. And now they're doing all their things and they don't, know, yeah, they don't know how to manage their time. And so that can be something we can help with as well. Um, sort of on that academic front a little bit, um, just managing their stressors and, and looking at their rhythms and routines and getting them on track with, you know, good sleep patterns and, and, you know, healthy, healthy rhythms and things like that. That can be another thing we see. So Okay. Um, and of course we alluded to just losses, you know, with, with parents separating or things changing, like that can be something that affects kids. And so we're dealing with a lot of kids who are dealing with that kind of thing as well. So what kind of resources are different? So, you know, we've talked about the different things we're working with teens. Obviously we have lots of different training and modalities as therapists, but what kinds of things do you see really being helpful with teens in terms of resources or strategies um, you know, and how is that maybe different from some of the things you might do with an older client? Okay. So the resources that I use with teens, I think it's really cool what I can bring into the therapy office or virtual office. Um, virtually I like to pull up a weekly check-in if the team has trouble coming up with what they want to talk about that session. I have this nice laid out template and what's your biggest struggle this week? What are three things that you're proud of? When were you your happiest? What When did you have fun this week? And then that way we can kind of go off of those talking points and it gives us something to bounce off of. And within probably five minutes, they're like, oh yeah, this is what I want to say. Right. Like, so is that prompt? Yes. Where yeah. adults might come, like, I got to talk to you about my conversation mm-hmm. with my husband. They're like, I know I'm here, but they don't know how to kind of take stock. Maybe they're not quite ready or they're hesitant. And then something like that just kind of opens it up. And it's a systematic thing that kind of, you know, they work through. And then that's something that they can track weekly. Like, are some of those things changing, you know? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And then I think different worksheets. So some of my clients are like, yeah, I like to see it in front of me, have something tangible and we can go through it together. So I do a lot of values work. So what do values mean to you? And what are the values that you have in your life? And how do they integrate into your life and how do you want them to show up so we do that all online which is very cool we can do it in person as well but having those tangible worksheets and seeing what they're learning in front of them a lot of the clients like that Mm -hmm. Uh, and then having other laminated resources so I have some affirmation cards that I've used before and a lot some of my clients are like oh I really like to have that positive self-talk and integrate that into my daily routine. So I have these fun, colorful cards and they pick them out three that resonate with them. And then that's Mm. what they go to for their week. Yeah. Yeah. I think with sometimes those tangibles, those worksheets, like the T I always say the teacher in me comes out. It's like, how am I going to get this person to engage with what we're trying to to do here? And so for some kids, those prompts or those, you know, having question card decks and things like that, which are things you probably wouldn't do with an adult group, right? Like maybe a group you do for some icebreakers or something, but not in a general session, would you be taking out these questions, you know? Um, and so, you know, it's really interesting, some of the things we can do. And I love that you pointed out that you do things online and I've seen you do this because I've observed a session and it blew my mind. It's amazing. We know this in the virtual world that we can do lots of things, but it's amazing how interactive that can feel. So even if you're a student who, for whatever reason, either, you know, doesn't live in the area or scheduling wise is trying to connect online, Um, lots of kids are maybe that's maybe their comfort zone, even coming out of COVID, they might want to meet online even before they transition to in-person because of some of those anxieties. And that might be a progression, but there's a lot of interaction that can happen in that space. And I've seen Rebecca masterfully 
work with worksheets and numbers and stars and everything on the screen. And it's like a, it's like a magic show. So, um, so there's lots of really awesome things that can be extremely engaging, even in that online space that you'd normally do with, you know, with markers or stickers or something in person. Um, and that's obviously tailored to the student, not everybody, not every teen or youth is keen on those things, but what works for them, which is our goal here at Covey Wellness Center to really, you know, let the the client be in the driver's seat and figure out what works. And if, if that's helping to open them up, then we keep it. And if not, we toss it and try something else. When I was working with City of Barry Day Camps, when one of the main things I learned is to have a plan A, plan B, and plan C, because you never really know what's going to go down. So Totally. You go into the session and the, the client will be able to guide the whole thing. And that's excellent. And you go off of what they're saying, but then sometimes they do need those prompts, but maybe those prompts that you had aren't working out. So then you have to shift again. So it's just staying on your toes, adapting, and yeah. just really connecting with that individual in front of you. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's sort of like, it's sort of like having our own toolkit as a therapist, which we encourage our clients to build, but we need our own toolkit. And so sometimes when we are working with teens and young adults, you have those go-to resources in a box or in a Google file that you can just pull and say, you know what, I think this worksheet, these questions are going to help us open up this topic. I think, you know, this, this self quiz that we could work through is going to be a great way to open this up for us or, or to further us in our understanding of what's happening here. And so really, really engaging in the best ways possible. And again, tossing that all out the window, if the client is just Yes. there and ready to go and doesn't need it. Yes. And um, that's great. That's yes. Great. Yeah, exactly. So really meeting them where they're at. But I do think there's a bit of that toolkit toolbox that's specific for that age group, especially to some of the, our younger teens. So at Covey Wellness Center, um, we are now able to see sort of that preteen age group, the 10 and up, we used to only be like 13 and up, but we're able to see kind of those, those early preteens into teens. And there can be some things we do differently there, like shortened sessions. You know, sometimes we'll only do a half hour session with somebody who's 10, or we might do something um, a little more tactile, again, getting out the cards, getting out a feelings wheel that's a simplified, you know, version for a younger age group or working with, um, you know, other tangibles, that, that kind of stuff. The, the younger you are, the more you might bring some of that stuff in to help them. Uh, express feelings to understand, you know, um, games, things like that can be helpful. So uh, I think there's some neat things that we bring in that actually might be really cool to use with clients in, that are adults, but we just wouldn't tend to do that. But yeah. some of those questions would be really cool to to open up adults, I'm sure as well. Um, but I, we definitely see some of those differences um, when we're working with those younger teens and young adults. Okay, so just in general, Rebecca, so when you think about this, this age group that you love to work with, your background with them, all the things you're learning, all the tools you're getting in your toolkit and how exciting it is for you to see their progress and build these relationships. How would you describe that ideal client? Like somebody wants to reach out and work with Rebecca. Who Who is the person that wants to work with Rebecca based on things? If you don't already know from our conversation today, that you're like, Rebecca's the person for my kid, or like, I'm, I mean, I'm imagining that's mostly parents who are listening to this, but if you're a teen listening to this, awesome. I love that you're listening to podcasts, but for the most part, I'm imagining it's more parents listening to this about their teens. And you might be thinking, that's awesome. I'm going to reach out um, because I would love for my teen to work with Rebecca. I can see how that would be such a strong relationship, but for, from your perspective, like, what are you, what's awesome from your perspective in a client? So like you said, a lot of the parents are the ones reaching out and being like, I think my kid will benefit from this. I love that. But my ideal client is when that teen or that youth, they are willing to give you a shot. They're mm -hmm. willing to open up. They're willing to sit there in that awkward silence, maybe the first couple of sessions while they get to know you and you start to foster that connection. And they're willing to let it grow and give it a chance. And I yeah. think that's my ideal client is someone who, despite them being nervous or feeling awkward about having to go to therapy, because there's a lot of stigma behind that, that we don't have to get into right now, but yeah, it's willing to give it a chance. Yeah. Like teachable and open and like, and maybe, maybe a little nervous. It's normal. Like 
lots of people have difficulty like taking that first step to come out to therapy, but teens who are like, you know what, I'm going to give this a try. I think this is important. I know my mental health, you know, is important to me. And this is one way that I can work on that. And even advocating for themselves, you know, that's awesome because they're already partway in the engagement of the process, right? There's a little bit with teens where the parents like, you know, make them come and we work with them and they warm up to that. And we take time for them to be used to it and building that rapport. And we're really focused on the value for them. But it's really amazing. And, and we do see changes where then they are telling their parents they want to come to therapy. I like I mean, to that... see the ice melt. Like, yes. Oh, here we yeah, go. Totally. Yeah, yeah exactly. And yeah. so there's a bit of a longer process, right? Because they're not as far along in the engagement of like, I want to do this. I want to show up. I'm ready. It's more like, mm, I don't know. Like, I'm just going to kind of take this in and we'll see. We'll see. And over the course of a few sessions, that engagement comes and they start to see the value in it and they notice how much better they're feeling and how much clearer they are and how they have these practical, helpful strategies for going into their week. Yes. And then that starts to self-perpetuate. But that client who is who is young and saying, I want this for myself. This is a priority for my health. I'm all, I'm ready. I might be nervous, but I'm open and I'm interested and I'm going to do the work. I, like that. that is just, it's a recipe for, for so much success, right? Because so much of therapy depends on the client's engagement with the process and their ability to take that out of the therapy room into their daily life. The therapist isn't with them. So they need to take, they need to be able to take that and implement that in their regular life. And that requires something of them, right? So, um, yeah, so that's, you know, that really, that I could see how that's a great client. And I would echo that that's a great client at any stage of life, yeah, you know, the person yes. who's, who's really ready. And that's why really therapy is for people who are voluntarily saying, I want to sign up for this, because that's the sign that they're ready, you know, um, even if they don't know, and they don't know what they're ready for, but they have that, that sense of that. So that's awesome. So if you're wanting to work with Rebecca, um, and you want to reach out, you can do so the way you reach out to us for anything through the website at the contact us form. There's an opportunity to put in a little bit of information um, about what you're looking for. And that goes right to our admin team. And then they would follow up with a short screening. A lot of times Rebecca's the one doing the screening right now. So depending on when you're listening to this, um, but uh, we have various people on the team doing the screenings and somebody would reach out and they get that information. Then we get you placed with somebody amazing like Rebecca. And so if you are wanting to work with Rebecca specifically, you can just indicate that in that inquiry and we can onboard you right away. Um, but if you have general questions or inquiries or want to go through the process, we're here for you. So CoveyWellnessCenter.com, contact us. We are also on all the places as Covey Wellness Center. So, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, um, you'll find us obviously in our podcast here at Covey Wellness Center podcast, and uh, we're pretty easy to find. So look us up and reach out if you're looking for help. Thank you so much today, Rebecca, for your time and Thank for talking you, with us about this age group. We are we are here for the teens and young adults. Absolutely, um, we love them. We welcome them. We can't wait to have them in our space and in our online spaces. Um, so we hope that uh, this resonates with that need and that we'll be able to reach out and help some people. Thanks again for today. Thank you. And thanks for tuning in. Be sure to give us a review and to follow and share with a friend if this is a helpful episode. Take care.